Hello and welcome back to the channel. I hope that everybody is doing well today. So for today's video, I am going to be talking all about cystic fibrosis, the symptoms, how we diagnose it, how we treat it. The treatment discussion is really exciting because over these last few years, we've made some remarkable advancements in this area. So I am excited to go over this topic with you. I used to watch Claire Wineland here on YouTube. If you've never seen her, I really recommend you watch some of her YouTube videos. She did pass away from complications related to cystic fibrosis, but she was a phenomenal just human being. Honestly, my interest in cystic fibrosis started with learning about her and just, I loved her. So if you're ever looking for something to watch, I really recommend that you look her up on YouTube, but that's what we're gonna be discussing today. But before we get into the content, if you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany. I am a nurse practitioner. Everything on this channel is either related to nursing or being a nurse practitioner. I also have a Patreon and on my Patreon, I have a complete AANP and ANCC review course. Make sure you look at the tiers and what they include there is a $40 tier and a $60 tier. The $40 and $60 tier both have the exact same review course, but only the $60 tier is eligible for continuing education credits. And there's also a $5 tier as well, which is case studies, clinical pearls, study guides, visual aids, all kinds of stuff. It's really helpful for new nurse practitioners, nurse practitioner students, even nursing students could definitely benefit from this. So if you're interested, make sure to check it out. Also, I do have a personal YouTube channel that I just started like a month ago. I do things a lot more casually over there, some lifestyle stuff, and I have some other plans for that channel going forward. If you're interested in checking me out, definitely go ahead and look at the description box below. Everything I just talked about will be linked there. But otherwise, without further delay, why don't we just get into today's topic of cystic fibrosis. Also, really quick before I get into the lecture, I did mean to mention this is pre-recorded and I am holding my little baby while recording this. So if you hear little squeaks and coos and all that stuff, it's because I have a three-month-old in my lap at the time. So just a heads up. All right, so let's start off first with a little background on cystic fibrosis. So though it is on the list of rare illnesses, it is, however, one of the most common life-shortening autosomal recessive diseases. So recessive genetic disorders, they occur when an individual inherits the same abnormal gene for the same trait from both the mother and the father. This genetic disorder, CF, it negatively affects a person's exocrine glands, and these are known to secrete sweat, tears, saliva, milk, and digestive fluids. So the abnormalities associated with the exocrine glands are caused by mutations to the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene, or much easier to say the CFTR gene for short. So the CFTR gene, it's located on the seventh chromosome, and it controls the production of a protein that regulates the transfer of chloride and sodium across the cell membranes. And this is found on all of the exocrine tissues. And so this mutation to the CFTR gene leads to an overproduction of abnormally thick, very viscous secretions that would generally be thin and slippery. And so these thick, viscous secretions then accumulate in the lungs, the pancreas, the liver, intestines, and the reproductive tract. And because of this accumulation of thick mucus throughout the body, obstructions can occur along with chronic inflammation and chronic infections, and it ultimately results in a multi-system dysfunction. So prior to the implementation of widespread newborn screening in the U.S., infants and children, they were typically diagnosed with CF after presenting with one or more symptoms. So for example, these would include respiratory symptoms such as a persistent productive cough, sometimes wheezing, or even breathing difficulties. Oftentimes too, they would present with a meconium ileus. And this is a blockage of the small intestine due to an abnormally thick and sticky first meconium bowel movement. And then finally, oftentimes they would also present with a failure to thrive. So now that newborn screening has become mandatory in all 50 states, patients are often diagnosed before even developing symptoms. So as cystic fibrosis progresses, many complications do arise. So individuals, they often will develop chronic bronchitis, 
which then leads to bronchiectasis. So this is the permanent dilation and destruction of a person's bronchial walls. And then eventually individuals with CF have permanent loss of their lung function, and they can develop chronic bacterial lung infections. This often involves either the Staphylococcus bacteria, which is a gram-positive bacteria, or a gram-negative bacteria. And then with this, the white blood cells, of course, will travel to the lungs to try and fight these infections. And as they break down, they leave a very sticky debris behind, which is believed to be a large contributor to the permanent lung damage that is associated with CF. In addition to the lung involvement that we see with patients that have CF, oftentimes they do suffer from many other health complications as a result of this disease and that buildup of the thick mucus throughout the body. So for example, we oftentimes will see pancreatic insufficiency. This occurs in most individuals with CF due to the buildup of mucus in the bile ducts. And this, what it does is it blocks pancreatic enzymes from reaching the intestines to aid in the absorption of food, and this can lead to malnutrition, even failure to thrive, which we had mentioned earlier, which is often was a presenting symptom with infants prior, prior to that universal screening. And then this damage to the pancreas over time will limit insulin production, and this can actually lead to cystic fibrosis-related diabetes. And then finally, persons with CF, they have a very salty sweat. And this is because of the dysfunction to the CFTR gene, and it causes an excess of chloride within the sweat. And this explains how we use the sweat chloride test when diagnosing CF, which we're about to go over here in just a second. But as you can see, CF, it causes a cascade of health complications most of which are directly related to that buildup of the abnormal, thick, viscous mucus throughout the body. All right, so let's discuss how cystic fibrosis is diagnosed. So the diagnosis of CF is made if both of the following criteria are met. So the first criteria is either the patient has clinical symptoms that are consistent with CF, they have a positive newborn screening, or they have a sibling that has CF. And then the second criteria is that they must have evidence of CFTR dysfunction. So evidence of CFTR dysfunction is established either by one, an elevated sweat chloride test of 60 millimoles or greater, two, the presence of two disease-causing mutations on the CFTR gene, or three, an abnormal nasal potential difference. So sweat chloride testing, this is definitely the most widely used and most important diagnostic test for CF and should be performed to confirm a diagnosis of CF in those infants that do have a positive newborn screening. Also, in any patient that has symptoms that suggest a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis and in all siblings of individuals that have a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. So as already mentioned, a sweat chloride of 60 millimoles or greater is considered abnormal, and this is highly specific for diagnosing CF. However, it should be confirmed by a second sweat test or DNA testing. Other important values to be familiar with would include a sweat chloride test of 29 millimoles or less. This is considered normal, and it is sufficient to rule out a diagnosis of CF. And then a sweat chloride test of 30 to 59 millimoles. This is defined as intermediate. And these patients, they should have repeat sweat chloride testing and CFTR sequencing to rule out cystic fibrosis. So the sweat chloride test, it can be done for anyone that's older than 48 hours. And it's performed using the medication pilocarpine or pilocarpine. Um, and what this does is it increases the secretion of exocrine glands such as the sweat glands. And so the medication along with a little electrical stimulation, this is applied to a small area of the patient, whether it be the arm or the leg, to encourage the sweat glands to produce sweat. And from there, a small amount of sweat is collected 
usually using either a piece of filter paper or gauze and it's sent to a lab for testing and ultimately they are measuring the amount of chloride in that person's sweat. So now let's move on to the treatment of cystic fibrosis. And so this is a really exciting topic because we've definitely seen huge advancements in this area, specifically with the use of CFTR modulators. And these actually target the defective gene and not just the consequences that we see from the disease. And so all patients that have cystic fibrosis, they should undergo CFTR genotyping, and that's to determine if they carry one of those mutations that are approved for the CFTR modulator therapy. Unfortunately, there is about a 6 to 10 percent uh, population of CF patients that actually don't have these responsive gene mutations, but the remaining demographic does seem to greatly benefit from this medication. And so I'm going to attempt to say it, but it's not an easy name of medication. It's actually a triple therapy, and it's Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor. It's also referred to as ETI for short, and it's sold under the brand name Trikefta. And this is used for most individuals with CF that are two years old or greater that do have a responsive CFTR gene. So this triple therapy, it was approved in the US for patients 12 and older in 2019, then children six and older in 2021, and then finally for children two years and older in 2023. And so you can see that this is relatively a new development in the treatment of cystic fibrosis. So Trikafta, this is really proven to be a remarkable drug and it's improved patients with CF, their FEV1, it's improved their symptoms and their quality of life, and it's also reduced the frequency of acute pulmonary exacerbations. And we've also seen an abrupt increase in their survival age. So now the median predicted age of survival with patients that have CF is about 68.2 years, and that was estimated in the year of 2022 which is in comparison to in 2019, their median survival age was 48.4 years. And so we've definitely seen a dramatic jump there. Some important points regarding this medication is that it should be taken with fat-containing foods, and this helps to improve the absorption. Also, grapefruit should be avoided because of its inhibition of the cytochrome P450 system. Also, medication dosing may need to be reduced in patients that have either hepatic dysfunction or if they are taking other agents that inhibit that cytochrome P450 system. So examples would be fluconazole or diflucan or that nermotrelvir or ritonavir, also known as Paxlovid, that we use for the treatment of COVID. There is a small concern for liver enzyme and bilirubin elevations, and so we really want to measure those before starting them on the CFTR modulators, and then we would keep track of them every three months for the first year, and then annually after that. So dosing of these medications should be interrupted. The literature says if either the liver enzymes are more than five times the upper limit of normal, or if those enzymes are greater than three times the upper limit of normal, along with bilirubin that is greater than two times the upper limit of normal. And then other options for those patients that are not old enough for this triple therapy. So patients that are one to less than two years, and if they have those responsive CFTR gene mutations, we have the combination of Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, and then for CF patients that are greater than one month, but less than one year, we have just the monotherapy Ivacaftor. In addition to the CFTR modulators, there are other measures to help promote lung health in this population. So for example, chest physiotherapy or CPT for short, and this helps with secretion clearance. So it can involve percussion, vibration, deep breathing exercises, and even coughing. And the person would get into different positions to use gravity and help drain that mucus from the lobes of the lung. You can see some images here. Um, and they do this while they are performing those CPT exercises. And so that's very, very useful for that buildup of mucus. 
Also, bronchodilators, this can help if the patient also has bronchial hyperactivity. And this is often seen with patients that have CF. And so they will use those bronchodilators like albuterol oftentimes in this population. And then doing their best to prevent infection. Staying up to date on all the required vaccinations, that's a really important part in maintaining that lung health. And then finally, sometimes these patients will require chronic treatment with azithromycin. This applies to patients that are six and older that have chronic infections with pseudomonas. And so that's another possibility in the patient's treatment plan. All right, I think that is going to be all for today's video. Hopefully you learned a little something. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out. I do appreciate it. Otherwise, you know, I wish you guys nothing but the best. Don't forget to learn something new every day and I will talk to you.